And welcome back to the show with no name as we take a closer look at the card culture. Kevin Nagandi, ESPN anchor, alongside Josh Luber, the co-founder of StockX. I appreciate the uh, the way back machine back in 1993, the World Series jersey popping that out. Number 29, number 29, anyone? John Cruck, I am not an athlete. <laughs> He's the man, though. Crucky, uh, much love to him as well on the Phillies broadcast. And uh, our Sixers got a win to open up their series against uh, the Wizards in the playoffs. You know, there were a lot of things going on. It felt really cool this weekend. Uh, it felt like sports was back, right, with the environment and the crowds that we saw in the playoff games, the PGA Championship. I got the chance to experience, you know, that playoff environment in Philadelphia. For you, you had the chance to experience something that was really cool, too. For the first time in a couple of years, you went to a big card show, and that was in Dallas. And uh, you posted some stuff that you got from uh, from the show on Instagram. And, Make and, you jealous? Make you just a little bit oh, jealous? Oh, hell yeah. There are many, many <laughs> moments that made me jealous. But let's start with one specific card and lead up to uh, your your big your big catch, the yeah, prize. Yeah. But I want to start with specifically the Bart Simpson's Matt Groening card that because to me that popped Josh tell me about the experience at the card show and landing that card we'll put that down for a second we'll save that as just a slight bit of uh of tease that's how they that's how they do it in tv right you, this is yes like, this is what's exactly later. yes I'm, I'm learning from the ESPN professionals thank you very much um man I haven't been to a card show since probably the end of 2019 and, uh, and ironically, the, the card show that I went to at the end of 2019 was at this uh, tiny little town in the middle of Michigan that, I, you know, I live in Detroit or the Detroit area. I drove about an hour into the middle of the state to go to, I mean, I, it, I'm, at, I'm at a loss for words. It, it, was, it was almost comical how, you know, there was like 12 tables. I was the youngest person there by like 35 years. Um, it was exactly what you picture of like the old school of like what the card industry used to be. Um, and so fast forward, uh, I am in the process of moving to Austin, Texas, and I was in Austin uh, on Thursday of last week uh, looking at a house and there's a card show in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I was like, screw it. I was like, let's figure it out. And I drove to Dallas and I texted a friend of mine who is a dealer who is going to be set up there. And I said, hey, I was like, I only got a couple hours. I can, I got to leave by tomorrow morning. Can you get me a dealer badge so I can come in, you know, and just shop the floor when everyone else. Guy's like, no problem. He goes, but just so you know, he goes, just with the dealer level, the place is packed. He's like, I can't leave my table. He goes, the doors haven't even opened to the VIP crowd yet. Usually you have the VIP crowd that can come in a couple hours before the general public. And then you have the general public. So it was packed on Thursday night. The energy in the place was, was, phenomenal. And I thought a lot about what we talked about last week, including a discussion point that we were put out there, which is that, hey, you know what, we're in this dip in the industry of pricing, but maybe it's a function that there's just so much to do. There's so much to buy. There's so many places where cards are being sold that you spread out that demand and therefore prices come down, but that the total dollars being spent, the total market may actually be up. And man, I, I am now 100% bought in on that theory because this past weekend, there was a card show in Dallas. There was one in St. Louis. There was one in Virginia. And there was a golden auction, a heritage auction, an REA mm -hmm. auction. And there was a usual sort of big weekend uh, PWCC eBay auction going on. So that's seven big events that a year ago would have been the singular thing going on in the hobby at that time. And all demand would have been focused there. So just absolutely extraordinary to be there and to be in the middle of, of that energy going on. And like, there was nobody in that place that was complaining about a dip or worried that it like, no, like it was like energy frenetic. Like everybody was in there to buy, to make deals. And I, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. I love hearing that, that, that the energy and uh, people are fearless because they're not afraid. Hey, buying the dip, right? We've been saying that. Yeah. But, but it also goes to something we talked about uh, last week is, understanding the pricing market, right? Because uh, when you go to your card ladder account, like you and I have on several occasions referred to uh, while we take this, 
sometimes you feel like, oh, it's, it's, it's a gut punch because you look at the numbers because they're basing it on eBay. So some of the, the price points here at the card show, they're never really recorded uh, as, as a basis. Did you notice that in conversations when you're talking to dealers and you're negotiating on price points on what is the baseline and what you're basing uh, the, the purchase on? eBay is still the standard. Um, it's yep. just, it's just the, it just is what it is. Um, and it's hard to find a real interaction at the card show um, where somebody's not pulling out their phone and, and checking prices and checking comps on eBay. And, you know, I was actually trying to use card ladder because it's quicker. Um, and invariably every price that I brought up on card ladder, somebody would, would argue about it. And then we'd have to go look at the eBay comps anyway. Um, <laughs> and, like this is just part of the, the problem of, of dealing with eBay data and which sucks. Cause I think card ladder, you know, they can be right, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, but if they have one wrong sale in there, it throws off that price changes people's perception of, of, of using it. Um, and that, so we're back there and, and we're negotiating through eBay. So that that's still the standard, but people have ridiculous price tags on stuff, hoping that you're not going to go check eBay so it just creates this, uh, this, this friction that is just part of the process that you have to understand that, that is part of the process. And what does this come down to? It comes down to conversation and relationships. And you, you, you go, you walk around, you do the general walk around. Uh, I'm ex- describing my experience. I, I'd love to hear yeah. yours. You walk around, you kind of scout things. You have, hey, just the casual conversation, but you're not making the purchase there. You're going to come back eventually. And then you create, even more of a conversation with the dealer, right? And, and then the negotiation begins. Like, how, how how do you approach it when you walk into one of these big shows? I realized walking through this show that at least in this world, uh, maybe partly because of this show and partly because of stock and everything else, um, that they know who I am. Uh, and that's not necessarily good because you can Google the valuation of stock X right now. Uh, so that doesn't really help uh, all the time uh, in negotiating. The flip side of it is that uh, people are certainly, uh, well, uh, they're more likely to, to engage in that conversation and, and talk and or want to uh, take a picture of the deal, uh, you know, part of it. And so at least gives the opportunity to create a, a fair deal where somebody at mm-hmm. least knows they're not going to take advantage of me because they know I have some at least baseline knowledge of, of what's going on in the hobby. But most of the time, you know, I'm pretty straightforward about it. You know, I, I, there's a card that I want. I kind of just start with like, Hey, do you have any room on this? And yep. you know how somebody answers that will, will tell you, you know, if they're even open and, and willing to trade, but most of the stuff I'm looking at is stuff that's it's rare enough that there should be some room on it. Cause there's just not that many out there. Right. If you're buying something like a, a Luca 2018, you know, Prism PSA 10 base, eight, 18,000 pop or whatever it is, like that price is a market price is market price. Whatever it's yep. at, like no one's coming off of that by, by 10, 15, 20 percent because you can buy 100 of them, you know, on eBay for that price and you can sell them at that price. But, you know, some of the stuff like like this. Yep. Right. Which we I guess we should talk about this now. Um, so, as you know, I've been a huge proponent. I continue to be a huge proponent of non-sport cards. And then I think the other iconic, important parts of culture will continue to be important in cards. And I had never seen this before. And I was at the table and I was buying this card from the, uh, the, the, uh, the guy, um, yep. this is, uh, Otani black. So it's numbered to 67 and it's a PSA 10 for the black parallel. Uh, very rare for PSA 10. And I've been buying a bunch of these. I have, um, you know, I have a, a handful of the of nine fives. Um, mm-hmm. And just one of the cards that I was looking for at the show generally is, is Otani rookies and in particular the black parallel. So between the two of them, I was able to negotiate a fairly good deal, but it's because there's just no real market value on this. And, mm-hmm. uh, and in, in transparency, the guy had a price tag of $10,000 on this. There are two other on eBay right now, or at least the other day when I checked, those other two have uh, have uh, captions um, that Bart's saying something because this card is hand drawn by Matt Groening, and it, it's it's numbered to four hundred. It was in mm-hmm. packs of Skybox in nineteen ninety three, um, and you know after talking to the guy and doing some research on this card, I mean this is extraordinary. I mean this is a Matt Groening RPA. I mean it, it's it's amazing. Um, 
and it's the Simpsons, right? And the Simpsons is in the same category with Star Wars and Pokemon and every amazing, you know, IP for the last, you know, hundred years. So um, I didn't end up paying ten thousand dollars. I I ended up uh, paying about seven for it um, in combination with another deal. Um, but that's one of those ones that that was that relationship. The guy had actually sold me some stuff before. I didn't know that he had sold me stuff on eBay uh, and recognized me. And uh, maybe I shouldn't have my my name on my eBay account. I don't know. Uh, I've but done that like, too. Hey, I, you know, I, yes. Yeah. 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 He's like, hey, I, you know, I sold you some stuff before, and blah blah blah. And so it was great. So and and he was very nice. He was very reasonable. Um, and and like I feel like this is a steal. The other two that are on eBay right now, the guy's asking seventeen thousand and fourteen thousand. Um, and I'm kind of tempted to go try to buy as many as I can because I can't imagine how many are out there. But I mean, like, how cool is that? Of like a Matt Groening, like hand drawn, like card. And you know, dude, it's, it's it's Simpsons. So it's it's phenomenal. And it goes back to the mindset that you've had, and you've talked about this a couple times in the past, but this is proof in the pudding here with your experience at the Dallas card shows, you're getting rare cards, right? Yeah. And, and, and sometimes eBay is not the measuring stick. Card ladder is not the measuring stick because these are cards that are very limited. They're always numbered, right? And they're very rare, especially when it comes to the grading possibility. And that, that Otani black is a perfect example. Only 67 of them to have one. That's a PSA 10 is, is so rare. Right. Um, what other, pickups stand out in your mind from the experience and then we'll get to the big we'll get to the, we'll get to the, the trade yeah the uh and you know what is like i rarely trade um just because it's complicated and and you just argue over what's this worth what's that worth and the market's so liquid that usually you can just sell some cards and then buy it uh so we'll get to the trade but i will say that the demographic of, of the um of the card show was night and day from the last time I was at a show. Now I happen to be mm -hmm. at pretty much the, like the far end of the spectrum in terms of like demographics at that last show in, in, in the middle of Michigan. Um, but you know, at the national 2019, one of the days there I was wearing a pair of uh, like vape cargo pants, which is, you know, this like camo pattern. And uh, man, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Everyone was like, what the hell is that? Like nobody, and nobody like was looking at my shoes. You know, I walk around the, any room I'm in and I just look at people's shoes and I can tell when other people are, and nobody was looking at my shoes here. Like this might as well have been sneaker con in Dallas. I mean, the number of kids that were dressed just like they were, you know, this is stock X convergence. Every, every theory we ever had about these two worlds, like merging, like the theory's mm -hmm. over, like it, it's happening. It is very clear. There was a couple of booths that were actually just selling sneakers. Um, and, so, I mean, you have, it, it's, um, it's phenomenal. And, and also goes to the point we were talking earlier about the health of the hobby of having all of these young entrepreneurs in the space, yep. are buying and selling cards and are, and are excited about it. And like those people are not buying and selling on eBay. If they're not doing it in real, per, in, in real life at a show, they're probably buying and selling it on Instagram or on Facebook groups or in the forums or, or whatever it is, because they're just more comfortable there from a social standpoint. Anyway, mm -hmm. so demographics are great, but none of those kids are buying 1976 Philadelphia 76ers uh, uh, picture pack oh, with Julius Irving. Man, yeah, and I like this is basically just for you and I to like nerd out about six stuff. So yeah, in this thing, so it says uh, action photos uh, photo pack. Uh, I paid 89 bucks for this thing. Actually, I, I negotiated down with this guy. So here's who's in the pack. It's George McGinnis, Caldwell Jones. World Be Free, Henry Bibby, Daryl Jawkins, <laughs> Joe Bryant, uh, Doc, Doug Collins, Steve Mix, Harvey Catchings, Mike Dunleavy, and Terry Furlow. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not planning on opening this, um, but like so cool. So I found this one dealer uh, who had okay. all of this old '70s stuff and happened to have a ton of Sixers stuff. So I also got this, which is an iron-on decal of Julius oh! Irving. From, uh, it is, I forget what, what year he said this was, um, but clearly in the 70s, clearly like he had just come over from the EVA, but it's an yep. iron on decal, uh, which is so badass. Um, then this is a flip book, and I'm not gonna flip it because I don't wanna, but it's a yeah, flip yeah, book. Yeah. Inside of it, it's got Doc, Kareem, uh, Pistol Pete, David Thompson, Bill Walton, and Dave Callens. Um, I'm convinced this show is about you getting me jealous. That's what this uh, whole premise well, that's, is. Yeah, that, that's certainly possible. Um, and then this, uh, which was 75, 76, is um, these like McDonald's pop-ups. And um, Doc's not in this um, one, but, you know, there's Steve Mix on the front. 
Uh, yeah. Also, it's like six sixers, and it ha- it's like Hal Greer, a couple other people, um, uh, Billy C. Anyway, um, and then I got some a bunch of cards too. I mean, like just like flip through. I mean, this stuff's all. Um, none of this stuff is ex- you know is really no, valuable, but, but it's that's you know the just stuff that's vintage yeah. and, and we love and geek out over. Yeah, Ooh. I mean, I basically cleared out this guy of every sixer. Uh, pro- I mean, I don't know what that card is. That's that was a Sports Illustrated poster that they made into a little card. Yep. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so I basically cleared them out of, of all Sixers stuff, um, and all of that stuff was cheaper than any one card I bought for everything else, right? Because it just is, right? Like I, I think I was maybe, I think like his 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 it added up to uh, like four eighty five or something, and I think I gave him four even for it. I mean. Like, I think that's a win-win for everybody. You get what oh. you want, and and that man walks away with, you know, stuff that he's he's not looking as as a prized a collection for you. It's it's all personal. It's what you like, right? It's all personal. Let Let's get to the trade uh, because, again, we talk about rare cards. This is one of the rare cards, especially in this space right now, when we talk about mass production and, and what's a rookie card for some some star right now this card when you talk about Shohei Otani is the card I and no also like partly like still speechless with so I was packing for for this trip and it was it was late at night because I, I decided to go I decided to go at the last minute so it's like 3 30 in the morning and I was packing and uh and I had to leave for the airport at 7 a.m and I so I hadn't even slept and uh and I was like and I've never take cards to trade um and I was like you know what I was like I've spent so much money on cards I have a lot of cards that I would sell I have a lot of cards that are high value but relatively um there's, there's a fair amount of them out there, like Tom Brady rookies, Mike Trout rookies. Yep. I, just, I have a lot of cards like that because I was buying so much of that stuff back in end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And so I have very low cost base on that stuff. So I grabbed about, uh, I think it was 16 cards. I put in a, uh, you know, a StockX PSA box, basically put what could fit in there. Um, all the cards were somewhere worth between one to $10,000. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'll just take this just in case. I'll probably never even take it out of my backpack. And, um, and so I get the show and I'm like, all right, well, what am I going to look for? Because I didn't, I hadn't even thought about it before I walked in the door, but if you don't have a goal walking into a show, you're going to end up everywhere buying everything. And it's just, it's, it's so overwhelming. Yep. And so I was, I thought back to our conversation last week and I was like, you know what? I was like, if there's anyone that's massively undervalued right now, it's gotta be Otani. And I have a couple and I was like, so let's see what I can find. And so I, you know, I found, I found the black one. I like the black parallels. Um, this card is, uh, there's, this is number to 2018. This is the top mm-hmm. gold. I mean, you can see that, right? Um, so I grabbed one of these and I was like, you know what? Like, I'll just look and see what other Otani's out there. Um, on Thursday night, the show is open to the, was open to VIPs and then the dealers and it closed at, at nine. They don't kick you out like at a hard nine. And at about like 8.45, I walk by a table and I see this card on the table. This is- That is the gold. This is Otani Super Fractor, one of one. Mm. Um, there, you know, he's got a bunch of different tops and tops Chrome cards from 2018, but most of them are pitching. And so uh, there's a, a little bit of a desire around this card because it's one of the few that he's batting. So um, it's Super Fractor, it's a one of one. And so I asked the guy, I said, what are you looking for that? And he said, I got an offer at 75,000 cash. Well, gulped a little bit. I was like, I don't really uh, want to pay that. And he goes, but he goes, do you have anything to trade? In fact, I do. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, in fact, I, you know, I like, I don't know if I even would have offered that or I even would have gone down that path because here's the thing. Most people don't want to trade one big card for 20 small cards because yep. Just from a scarcity standpoint, like you get a higher premium off of one cart. Most people don't do that. Um, but he's like, do you have anything to trade? And I was like, actually I do. And so I took out my box. I pulled out at that point, I had only bought uh, one card. The only card I'd bought to date at that point um, earlier that day was this card, which is Beauty. Uh, an Iverson Epic Signatures. Um, this card is um, 
I bought from the same guy that I bought all the Dr. J stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I, I bought the Dr. J stuff the next day. So I only had one card. So I pulled this out and said, this one's not for trade. This I just bought. Um, and I gave him all 16 cards. And he looked through and he goes, I bet we can figure something out. I was like, okay. It took like two hours um, going back and forth because the, the total dollar amount of the cards in their market value was probably around a uh, hundred thousand. Yep. Um, and so I ended up basically giving them everything except for two cards. And then I added in uh, $4,000 cash, which was basically all the cash I even had on me um, to make that deal work. So um, we could put up the, the picture of the deal. As you can see, there's 14 cards. Um, like I said, a lot of these are cards I have a lot of, and I have a low cost basis. The Connor McDavid rookie, by the way, which is uh, market value is about four grand for that card right now. Yep. I bought 25 of those at $400 a piece back in Come 2019. Come on. When I didn't even know who Connor McDavid was, but at the National in 2019, I was uh, uh, Beckett. Beckett has a podcast and they interviewed me on the podcast. And the podcaster couldn't stop talking about Connor McDavid and couldn't start talking about how, you know, he's the next Gretzky and his whole thing. And I said, I was like, well, you know, PSA 10 is like 400 bucks. He goes, yeah, yep. I think that's massively undervalued. Um, and so I, I had the opportunity to buy a lot of those. And so I've been selling those off slowly. So I got my cost base on that is $400. I'm getting $4,000 in trade in this deal. So all those cards I have multiples of, or I have the 10 and I'm, and I'm selling the nine. So 14 cards uh, plus 4,000 in cash, we figured the market value of that was around 90 uh, yep. in trade. Um, but for my cost base on that, I mean, I mean, it's probably 15. Like, I mean, it was, you know, so uh, it was by far the biggest trade I've ever done. Um, it's certainly possible that, you know, Otani gets injured again and, you know, all mm -hmm. that stuff is, you know, is worth way more, but I'm okay. Like I'm okay taking that risk and okay. Having possibly, you know, the best card of possibly the most unique player of, of this generation. So and, it's a risk, and to sum it up, take it. like your cost basis is so low considering how much you were getting back value wise, right. At the time mm -hmm. and how much you invested early on in the last couple of years to see the rise here. I mean, looking at just the, 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 the Brady Chrome was so undervalued for right. years. And then we've seen a little bump here over the last few months after winning the Super Bowl, but the, the Jordan card, you know, in the last year, the bump there, like the, of course, the Luca purple ice, like some of that stuff, like you invest it. I mean, the Iverson uh, refractor right there, like you're investing yeah. in things back in the day where their value, you know, you're, you're, you're putting in a little bit, but gaining a lot more big picture wise. And how did you feel after the negotiation? Again, the biggest trade, you got to walk away. Because that's one of those moments where it's like, do you have regret? Do you uh, doubt yourself? How did you feel when you walked away? Yeah, um, I think it was maybe a negotiations class in business school that a professor said, you know, a good negotiation is when both people are upset, right? Both people feel like, <laughs> you know. Um, yep. And, uh, and he was definitely struggling. Um, he, well, first of all, he really wanted more cash, he, you know, yep. and – I was like, look, man, I don't have more cash. I don't have time to go to the bank. I'm leaving like first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and so he was struggling a lot with it. Um, but I think also, and he told me the story of, of this, is he bought this from a kid who pulled it out of a pack and graded it. Uh, he found the kid on Facebook. He told me he got this and like maybe like four or five other uh, big cards and paid like four grand total. So his cost base on this was nothing also. Okay. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. So yeah. like, so we're both, you know, you're, you're look, cost basis is important, but so yeah. is market value. And, you totally. know, he, you know, and so, you know, we were both kind of, you know, struggling with it. Um, I think him more so than I, because most of the time people don't trade big cards for lots of small cards. And so knowing that I was willing to, you know, give a little bit more in trade, could I have sold all that stuff for 90,000 in cash then paid him something like maybe but like yeah there's just a lot of of uh there's just a lot more friction in doing that so um i don't know i i i was i'm still a little bit i don't know worried right there's still yeah. risk in in otani totally. like you know uh but it's just exciting to have it and like i'm willing to take this risk i got a bunch of those other cards so 
Yeah, that's the key. You got to take the leap here when you're uh, making the gamble. And yep. uh, listen, uh, you that have card to be is in the room to card. do it. Like you have to be in the room to do it. Like that. That's kind of my, like when I left the show and been like, ah, like I forgot how much like fun the show is to 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 find this stuff where most of the stuff is not on eBay or, and most stuff you don't have the opportunity to have those conversations and, and do that. You want to buy like, you know, Zion based 10 rookies, eBay is the best place to buy it or, yes. or, or any marketplace, like no problem, but you want to find stuff like, like this, you know, or the Dr. J stuff, or this is another card that I got, which is not at all valuable. I pay like, I don't know, hundred bucks, but this is a card from the LeBron's commercial. You remember yep. the, the four LeBron's? Um, yep. And it, this is one that happens to be numbered to 25 and it's got uh, like, I don't know even what it says dual threads. I don't even know what was a t-shirt they wore on the, on the commercial shoot or something. I don't know. But like that commercial was iconic. Uh, and just, I thought a pretty cool thing. Um, so I mean, same with this one, right? This is a Gene Hackman autographed Superman card. I love it. Right? Lex Luthor, the, the original. The original Lex <laughs> Luthor, right? Uh this card isn't even graded. It's in an it's in an authentic slab, but uh, the autograph is authentic. Uh, I think the guy had like a two fifty price tag. I think I paid two hundred bucks for it. But like, this is like one of my favorite cards from the show. Um, yep. But like, that's a fun thing of like finding that stuff, you know, there and walking by the next table and, and seeing that stuff. So now I'm now I'm like scoping out every show between now and the national to figure out, you know, what else I can go to. So. Brother, you hit a home run because you, you got value at the same time. You got a big trade, but you also got cards that you love. And that's why we're in this, uh, this space here. And that's why we go to these shows, right? And the experience. And let me tell you, National will be off the hook in a couple months. Cannot wait. Yeah. I'm glad we we're moving forward with that idea. And uh, you can only imagine the vibe and the experience there. So uh, listen, usually we end the show where we kind of flex a little bit. I'm kind of embarrassed if I even bring a card. You won, and you continue to win with with your showcase stuff, and uh, that that Otani's a beautiful hey, card. You have to. You waste too much of your time, you know, reading highlights. You got to spend more time, you know, searching eBay for cards. <laughs> you got that right, man. Yeah, I'll just actually explain that to the wife. Yeah, I'm just gonna be on eBay for here for the next few hours. All right, you got the kids. Uh -huh. We'll figure it out moving forward. For hey, sure. and listen uh, for our audience. If you've got a comment or you got a suggestion, uh, you got something that you want us to talk about, hit the comment section on the YouTube page and, and we'll try to chop it up down the road. Uh, for Josh Luber, I'm Kevin Agandi. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, keep on collecting. See you later.